This is Sue Bach coming to you from the Harambe Auditorium at the Scarrett Bennett Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Barbara Young, who is our poet this evening. She's a, a native of Nashville, and now she and Jim and two cats live in nearby White Bluff. Turns out she was a poet in high school and college, but she gave it up due to a misconception. She thought writers wrote because they had something important to say. It was once she was on her way to becoming a seasoned citizen that she discovered how wrong that idea was and that writers write because they need to write. Since then, she's published two books, two chapter books, and her new book is out. She can plug it a little bit later and hold it up and let you see and talk about where to find it. And it's now available from Madville Publishing. She can give you more information about that. And on our website is information about that and her website for more information as well. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Not used to this. So here's the book. I'm still not ready for it. It's only a month old. Bless its little heart. Um, you, you can get it, you can get it on Amazon, you can order it through Parnassus, if you're local, or, you know, you can just, you can figure out the way. <laughs> You'll like it. Um, I'm going to start at the end. This is, um, all right, I'm kind of a strange writer and I write strange poems. And this one has a little bit of all of it in it. So it's about the language and inevitable death. Once upon a time, and this is before you or I or your mother or the dry disappearing women who live under bridges were born, words, some words, had meanings unlike today's. Night, for instance, and alone. Alone, alone could fill all the space between all the yellow cities on the map with a hollow more empty than the echo of the emptiest of moved from homes. Dust where the dresser was, a penny, half a toothpick. But we live in pre-owned valleys and cook on the stove that came with the house. Wearing heirloom language to work, to regret, to shop for our suppers, we name common things and say we die and go to heaven, call the yellow night sky black. This is the woman with bad knees and the baleen whale. The woman with bad knees winced her way to the window. She needed inspiration. She was having a hard time. There was no room in her poem for a red biplane. But it was necessary. Its cartoon engine made the putt-putts that tickled her mind. Out the window, in the wide world, were pepper grains of people. Trees and small teardrop trucks would fit into her poem, but not a plane with cartoon putts. The woman wished with her heart her eyes and aching knees, for the great baleen of inspiration to rise from the pavement like a globe of silver bubbles, its krill syllables hanging on a pause, it would drink her poem and exhale a red biplane. Lamentation. I am a grief a guilt, I am a diet of dyer's herbs, woad and matter, a suite of lamentations made from drought and thorns as chapters made from words nihil. Like a dog, like a dog with sore feet and burrs, I emphasize pain, howling from my raw, nihil, nihil, nothing in dire, hopeless straits and hollow marrow, 
No mercy on the starving and the dust. Mercy, no mercy on the cattle drowning, silent frogs and still tadpoles, nihils, the broken cities, the greedy streets, our houses framed with dead men's bones. We have stolen the twigs out of the cook fires, stolen the very water from the pot, the kerosene from lanterns. How can we not play brass laments for fishermen's poisoned pools, black crawfish and foul rice? How can we not march slow for the murdered mothers, daughters, and sons? Our gates are beautiful locked. Hold nothing, hold nothing at bay, Nihil. And I am sorry, sorry, words change nothing and are bitter in the mouth. Time is a desert of rain. Again, the wind and the gray-toned clouds. Again, the sun is a broad, bright, moon. Again I ache, bruised from winter years. I forget why spring disappoints me. If the body creates tribes of cells charged to manufacture joy, mine have become nomads following rumors of light. When did they last know a home, a porch, a place to sit and knit elation while the long rains fall. This is one that I just kind of threw together, so it's not, it's a little <laughs> wonky here and there, but I like it. Age is like an avalanche. How much does an echo weigh? What's one more snowflake? Age is like kudzu, bush honeysuckle, starlings, feral cats. Age is like the heat and AC are sociopaths with a grudge, like a knuckle in the bicep, fighting the wind. Age is like a new song playing homage to its roots. Age is like gravity, sine qua non ding on zish. Age is like sun on a still groundhog day. Age is like a mountain and a train, like the climb and the view obscured by second growth trees. Age is like the department store girl armed with spray cologne. Age is like chicken on Sunday because, just because. Age is like the naked in class dream like the dream your grandmother tried to explain. Now here's the important part, and there's no solve. Age is like, your winner mailings are all hoaxes, but all bills are real. It's like walking on black ice, like someone else's underwear. Age is like hearing something in the night, but only once then smelling something. Funny, it's gone now. Mrs. Santa takes a hit off a skinny cigarette. Small table, hotel bar, nicotine fingers foul and yellow, spin the zippo through water rings, an antique nickel pointer for a phantom game of shoots and ladders, down and up and down again. No Ouija board answers or three, three strikes and now you can stop. There's no reason to be a good sport. Win or lose, the prize is nada. Instinct wants her to censor herself, but she knows that truth has the momentum of cancer she needs to be high again. It would be fine at the top of the world, all poise and porcelain, to be able to stand under the black sky, whirling around and around to the music.
This is from when I lived in East Nashville. Closing time, home. Time of sour bar towels and southern, southern owls, pocket change on the dresser, a comb. Next door, the band rolls in from Amy's high, unloads moody rhythms and chords. I have a dream with Richard Widmark, not young or in his prime, just this old man singing karaoke. The lounge walls are carved like stelli, painted tan, red, storm blue. The barman chants out, closing time. I don't care where you go, Irene, good night. Widmark blinks out, I'm alone. The moon is where the moon should be. If this were Nashville airs poetic hymns would underlie the hour like owl amens. The Island. Kristen, who cuts my hair, describes her long postponed honeymoon to the Bahamas. She, snip, says it was a telephone offer. Who in their right mind? But they did. In the mirror, behind blue barbicide, she shapes thin sheets of hair as she talks, but she's only a blur. Her island grows sweet and luxurious through my reflection. Later, home, and the weather shows a swirling egg yolk, red as a dragon's eye, aimed at the Bahamas. Someone told me once, don't go to Paris, it's not there. And if you love the book, <clears throat> don't ever see the movie. Untroubled by storms, Kristen's green lizards smile on from pink walls. I've always been interested in words. What's put away? It isn't just drunk fools who howl at the moon or blues men and boys with their hearts between their legs Women moan, and girls who don't know why. I'll tell you a secret. When I was young, 11 or 10, I cut the dirty words out of my mother's dictionary. Cut them with big black kitchen shears. It was hard. The paper was thin, and each page had two columns, like the Bible. Words, pronunciations, definitions, slivers translucent below their ink, all things genital, secondary, scatological. I stuffed into a dime store white envelope, hid in a hollow tree on Hogan Road. It may still be there. Drink word. I have grown up out and old, drinking invisible tea, diving blind to the world into paper vats of whiskey cadences. Syntax spoken by no known race curls around my throat, beads penetrates my tongue, layers deeper than mother words. I have played patty cake with gods and named dragons. How can such weird power buy noodle soup? Answer email. I have some of these that are kind of character studies. Chaz Bukowski works. This is the way I imagine it. Charles Bukowski is still writing. He's sitting on the floor of his hotel called the Great Eternal Flop House. It is both heaven and hell, which depends on the plumbing on any particular floor. Bukowski's room has a wash basin and a closet-sized space with a toilet and a tin shower, but no door. That doesn't matter, no one visits. The bed with its sagging springs sees no action. 
There's a dresser in the room with a blank frame where the mirror hasn't been replaced. An eternally dusty, faded, red armchair waits by the window. Bukowski sits on the bare wood floor, his back against the wall with a yellow legal pad and new yellow pencil, half a pack of cigarettes and a souvenir ashtray in the shape of a sombrero, bottle and glass. Because it's Labor Day, the American version of May Day, Bukowski, like Whitman down the hall, like Dos Passos and Steinbeck and Hemingway, Dorothy Parker, it's a big goddamn flop house and I could go on, is writing to honor the American working man and woman. The floor hadn't been mopped in three months of Sundays. The housekeeper slipped on a broken step and shattered her right kneecap. The surgeon who fixed it said the pieces reminded him of a wooden puzzle map of the lower 48 he used to love when he was a kid. Bukowski's brain is on fire. All the words pertaining to the great American worker are up there like sheep in a pen. To be their shepherd, he thinks, is good work. America, I love you, you big galoot. There's nothing on the bed but my iPad, so the cat uses that for a pillow. America, you are a cat. I love you, you and your eagles and flags, caps off, hands on hearts, pick up basketball three on three. Your face can be precise as a drag queen's or shaggy, a do-it-in-your-basement animated short cartoon. I have drunk you, America, in a loud dive bar, pool cue cocked, in a suburban Baptist church, patent leather. You have photobombed my family picnics with your brave tomorrow's news, you and your suicides by cop. I love you. Alligators and ticks, no see politicians, developers, I love your airports and your checks in the mail. You think you will win, get the last laugh just because I love you, honey? Wait until Mother Justice gets home. Um, I also have a series of poems about a character called Aunt Sister. I'm not doing most of the Aunt Sister poems, just a few of them. But Aunt Sister married into the Gatewelder family. Cousin Jill. I like a woman who can fall, Jack said to Jill. But Jill, who had some Gatewelder blood, Knew there would be bruises and tears to mend and a dented buckle to find and fill and explanations to make again. There always were. And if I don't get out of here, she told her diary that night, that hill, that bucket, and that man will reenact me to my grave. I know they will. This is the nature of time and the story. Before the woman died, there was no future without her. Thus we learn that the future also comes from nothing. Once I heard a good story, whether it was Crow told it or my iron kettle or the dull black checker I keep that belonged to my grandfather I can't recall, but used to be there was no time and everything was and will be all at once. People were, never existed, saw things beyond comprehension every day. Every day happened and didn't and would and shouldn't. Every day, even breathing was a confusion of whether to inhale. Back then, although history was everywhere, it hadn't been invented. Who was it invented time and history? who shook out the kinks, sprinkled on water and put a hot iron to existence, 
Who flattened the past with starch and made the future steam? Crow would have said it was the bird clan kettle, that time was a man-made thing. My dull black checker would say time was a lie my grandfather told to keep me quiet. I can't say. All three stories are in my mind like the truth. Of course, the woman is in my mind too, and she's dead and been dead. This is a gate welder story, a family story. Sliced tomatoes on the table, red to the core, big as a big man's fist, mashed new potatoes, bowl of pepper gravy, sweet corn on the cob and fried, green beans with ham hock, baby onion peas, veal peas, light bread, cornbread, new peach preserve, jam cake, and fried pies. Where's the chicken, says Sam. Everybody hushes, and Sam sits there, doesn't touch a thing, even his tea, waiting for meat. Doris, new to the family, is with Mama in the kitchen, shy. And nobody knows her either or has seen her mad yet. Even she sees Sam would rather shame Mama than eat, would rather have his own way than own the moon. And Mama's halfway to frying him some ham. Doris stops washing and comes out, big knife in her hand. She takes an egg from the blue bowl on the sideboard and cracks it on his head, says you want gravy with that chicken? <laughs> They got to be friends later on, more or less. Sam said he'd have them put that on her tombstone. <laughs> this is the condensed version of what, I'm not sure. She's like Noah, has a temper and a saw, makes angry boats. She's a teacher waves her hands like rain on thirsty trees. When she's walking, poems follow her like rabbit hounds or hickory snakes. She's a phenomenon. Nobody knows her mind. She's diagrammed like a hurricane. She hears voices. They won't shut up. They love her. Someday she'll die. That won't upset the wind, and she'll be gone. Seeing Aunt Sister. How long had it been? No one could remember. She missed Christmas, but with some excuse, some good excuse. And the big October birthday celebration. She'd been scarce in September, August, May. How long? One of Sarah's boys said he'd run into her last spring up at Gethsemane. They sat, talked about Merton, the weather, and crows, until Vesper Bells called the monks to prayer. The last thing he remembered her saying was odd, but like her, a quote that jumbled locks and keys with hawks and cell biology. He guessed she might have looked a little tired. The hospice nurse spoke for her eroded body ventriloquist and doll. He rounded out the language of her plucks and sighs and talked until her strength waned. She dozed. The family stayed, caught up on children, cars, dogs, meetings, separations. Together, they watched gray distant clouds draw rain shades across the farthest hills and the near ones and watched the vegetation by the window quiver with some scattered drops and darken. The Woman's Body Over Time. This is a photograph of the woman's body over time. 
There, where she is younger, she is a river with a river's arms. Fish tickle the small pool of her back. Her breasts are sun-scaled. Matured, she is, as seen here, a gently used automobile. Glossy, chrome on all four wheels, she has treated herself to high-end upholstery and steam cleaned her engine compartment. She taught her chassis to belly dance, spritzes her hair with that new hair smell. She died and became separate elements, a yarrow stick or two, the hanged man, a magic eight ball. Now the women of the family call out readings of her moods based on the scent of a wound she left a moment before they entered. I'm reading faster than I thought. I'll slow down like that. Rubies in the gravel. To have been loved is a star on the point of the moon. Suppose you misstep, stumble on a rolling pebble. You may lose sight of something rare, but may discover a ruby in the gravel. What if at 10 she had not tripped, split her lip, scarred her mouth? That was a crumb he wanted to lick away the first time he saw her. What if some other man had touched her shoulder that way first? What if Tom hadn't been a fool or Mike a little kinder? What if she'd missed meeting Frank? What if the sun, the moon, the rain, if Frank refused to die? She came to the family bereft and archaic, Ruth, cherry petals and snow, a lovely city shocked by bombs. What if she had come sure-footed, needing no one, her grief whistled into a yellow taxi. She could have gone away, left them undiscovered. To have been loved is the star and seeing the star. To have been loved is a pebble underfoot. Mississippi's of love. One night, I listened to a man read a hundred poems. They were short. Everyone contained the word cargo, and the effect was hypnotic. The overall effect was to strip the night of meaning. One might plug any word into the cargo slot. Hypotenuse, chipmunk, cancer, love. Like the percussion of a train's wheels on rail joints, cataracts of chipmunk, cyclones of cancer, Mississippis of love, 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 love. Love. Summer lasted well into November, making fall nothing much colorlessly beautiful days in calendar rows, clear bottle, clear sky bottles ranked in an open window. So I love a dreary sky. There is drought, so I love the soaking rain. Love it like bacon, black chocolate, beer, and anything with caffeine. I'm, again, trying to lose weight. Sleep won't accept my calls. And I love sleep. Dreaming a good, long, meaningless dream is just like being wealthy. I would love riches. Not to say I'd trade love for gold. Not Jim, not my brother, my cousins, not even the cats. Oh, but I do love rain. And this is actually where I got my love for rain. The storming carpet. 
When the sky turned green, my mother unplugged the house, folded a quilt by the front door. The room was still as an oven. Outside, black wind made big, big trees tug at their leashes. Through the screen door, rain cooled my cheeks. The loud lightning lit my pages and read to me. My mother taught me not to be afraid of storms. That's the best thing she ever did. <laughs> of course your mother cried when you left home. Your leaving is a stage of her labor, crying. You know the way sometimes in a small clear stream, a great brown mass of minnows turns and flashes silver suns too quickly invisible, you leaving seemed to turn forever. So accidentally beautiful not to cry would break the world. If they explained that at the start, she had forgotten. Sustenance. Absence began with a stutter step, became a rift, a cliff, a flight from which mom would return baffled and sad for the bones of her arms. When the weather let him, he would walk his mother to the lake beyond the parking lot. He pushed the chair like a shopping cart, said, look, mom, a goldfinch said mallard. Cattails said, I was reading the mafus you gave me and thought, said clouds, cumulus. Nourishing words to sustain a dying language. Once they found her resting on a green rickety park bench. I was going to the store for bread and that soda my boy likes. Thank you. I have been longing for a cup of tea. When you need them. Kid lives with her grandmother, wears a stupid hat all the time, fuzzy hat, nasty, looks like a dead dog. One day, her grandmother says, your daddy and his girlfriend are coming this afternoon to pick you up and take you away. Kid says, no damn way. Don't swear, Grandma says. You go hide in the shed out back. I'll lie, say you ran off. Kid says, don't lie. The devil will get you. Anyway, that's them out in the driveway. Kid says, I'll be back by supper. Opens the door. Granny goes to the kitchen. Soak the chicken in buttermilk, bake a little cake. There never are any fairies when you need them. This is one of the aunt sister poems. She was stunned, dull, breaking alive. It is not enough to exist, you must live. An ecstasy had become a strange religious memory. A light spoke that once upon a time pierced infinite grays. Stunned, dull, she had grieved. Tea from a thin bag old in the pantry, white saltines with cardboard Swiss, dull surrender of a mealy apple. Thinking she had lost her sense of smell and flavors because it was too difficult to be alive, she still smiled for others, walked where they directed, nodded in time to the chat and rumble, squinted into the afternoon glare off tin roof and glass. One of the women pinched the tip leaves off a plant. Smell 
and the world broke her alive again in peppermint. Monster. She explained that she suffered under a curse, that she had been a pumpkin before. She recounted a lifetime of sunshine, rain was ecstasy beyond her powers of speech. She might have been a saint of rain. The magician who made her first a golden coach and then a woman was the devil of her cosmology, having forced form, fate, and function on a soul that wanted nothing but to ripen and rot, fulfill a simple mandate without all of this talking. Nine and 60. An old woman in a cracked house loves equally the goldfinch upside down at thistle on the porch and the yellow-breasted backhoe that chugs akimbo, puffs and dips beak into the neighbor's trench. The woman is considering her last will and testament. Rather say, ought to be, but is avoiding it. Grasshopper, grasshopper never learned. If one train leaves for Memphis going west at 8 a.m. and four men dig a 40-foot well in four days, how long is one compound life minus one? What if the hand you always grab to pull yourself up out of ditches is gone? Into the gray beginnings of morning she washes things in blue pajamas, window panes, put grieving aside, aside. There's the electric and medicines, gas for the car, cranky old woman found dead in her home leaving cats, not yet grasshopper, finish your chores. A woman with no will or testament, gray raincoat over her pajamas on the front porch in the morning refills a plastic cylinder with thistle. Finches are wasteful. Black ants in a line cart their leftovers away. It's too late to become ant-like, sturdy, a banker of seeds and success. She feeds the cats because she can't go starting over and to give up and die is like cheating. I saw El Postino at the Belcourt Theater. After Pablo, where were you, <clears throat> what were you following when I followed you at the, end, at the end of El Postino? What tugged you through the paired lobby doors past the ticket booth and on to the sidewalk so abruptly, Nashville? I wanted to learn more from you about life and the night, or maybe only about poetry. What were you peering after in the darkness? And how is it that you never tripped, even though the sidewalk heaves and wobbles from high-rooted sycamores, your silhouette never stumbled any more than a cat would falter or a hunting hound? You didn't climb the steep plank ramp at Savarino's, or I would have gone there too, bought you an espresso, and if you wanted, the pale Italian cookies with flecks of sun, tarolucci a limon, but no, you passed on the opposite sidewalk. You visited no one that night. You could have knocked on any door. I once knew an artist on that street of stained bricks, coal dust from forgotten furnaces blending the bungalows together. My friend would have opened his door with pleasure for you. I lost you among the hackberry trees in the grove by the dragon park. The shade of you blended with theirs 
and you disappeared as I watched. A small black dog emerged sniffing and wagging from the shadows and picnic tables to keep me company while I waited until the sun rose. What did you find? What did you learn? On the way home, I bought a day-old pastry and broke off crusty bites for the dog, grateful for his company. When I opened my front door, he trotted off, pausing now and then to inspect a cigarette butt in the gutter, a drift of fallen sycamore bags. Too much Mandarin. The stars are all dead and have fallen. And with help, we loaded the pickup with all the other things that no longer functioned. Washing machine that shook itself to death, ancient computer face like dirty city ice, one stained mattress upon which no children were conceived, and so forth, drove somewhere. Nothing there but hills someone had burned with cigarettes. Thorns survived in kudzu. There was a ditch where an old Chevrolet dammed the runoff and buried itself in red mud. There we did our unloading. Appliances rolled down hills like snake eyes. Newspaper bundles and slick magazines fell like bad cards. Sliding down the mattress ripped some kudzu cover away to expose layers of garbage, households like ours. A daughter's bicycle with glossy mylar streamers looked to have been almost new, but vines threaded its spokes and frames, stitched it to the earth like Frida Kahlo. We have returned our portion. This is the beginning. The Big Show. This poem begins at 4 p.m. in front of the TV on a green rug edited for time. It is a Tuesday, so even joy will have consequences. Friday, and this poem might crush Tokyo or be doomed to drink your blood. Wednesday, comic. Monday, a mystery. Thursday, romance with song and dance. This poem might have been fun with giant ants and tap shoes or werewolves. What if the love story took place on stage, not in teary flashbacks? There might be a murder, color, bar fights. But this poem begins at 4 p.m. Tuesday. You know that accepting any premise has consequences. Thank you.